Hi, everybody. My name is David Newland, and it is my honor to be conducting this interview today with my friend, the Estelle Klein Award recipient for this year, Eve Goldberg. We are coming to you from Michisage Anishinaabe uh, territory, uh, covered under the Williams Treaties here in what we know as Coburg, Ontario. And this is the beautiful expanse of the loft above my garage. And <laughs> thank you so much, Eve, for making the trip out. Uh, so thank you for having person. me. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm really glad to be here. And congratulations, of course. I mean, the, <clears throat> I think the Estelle Klein Award is one of the highest honors that one can achieve in, in our community, certainly, but even in the in the broader music world, there is seldom an award given out. There are a few awards given out that recognize such a broad range of co contributions. Mm. And I'm thinking of the, I think it's 20 or 21 other recipients so far. And as you reflect on them, how does it feel for you to now find yourself among them? Well, Thank you, first of all. Um, the first thing is I was I was really surprised to be selected, um, especially when the list of other people nominated this year. Yeah, an, an extraordinary list. Who yeah. are incredibly worthy people. And um, so I was surprised and it's a little bit daunting and overwhelming when I look at the list of people who've received the award in the past, some of whom uh, I know and love some of whom are friends of mine and some of whom are uh, heroes or people that I've really looked up to for a long time. It's it's um, it's quite something. I haven't really taken that part of it in so much. Did you have a moment when I mean, even in the nomination sort of level at the nomination level, did did you did you have this moment where you had to ask yourself? what <laughs> what is going on here you know yes but it, both being nominated and being selected um just uh I, you know it's i you know maybe it's i think sometimes when you just go back doing your thing and you're passionate about and you're you've got your you know uh nose to the ground kind of uh doing what you want to be doing um you, you don't always necessarily see like everything that's happened and when the nomination happened i was like well, i don't know about that you know i'm just a musician i do these things that i'm, I'm passionate about uh but i don't know if i really deserve you know that kind of i'm sure we all have those self self-doubting moments but when i stopped and kind of you know itemized in my head well i did do this and i have done that and I thought, oh, okay. I, there's, there's, I, there's an accumulation of things right. that I'm, I am proud of. I'm proud of, you know, uh, things I've done, and, um, um, and it's just really gratifying to be recognized. I never thought that I would get that kind of public recognition for it. it and that wasn't the purpose of doing those things. It was um, because there are things that I care about it and mm -hmm. wanted to do. So. Um, well, and among those things, I mean, I'm just going to off the top of my head, <laughs> try to make a little list, but you have been in, in a founding or a key organizational or leadership role with Common Thread Community Chorus, mm -hmm. Arts Can Circle, Borealis Records, uh, the AFM 1000 Traveling Musicians Union, the Ontario Council of Folk Festivals, which became Folk Music Ontario itself. I know I'm missing a bunch. That those are that was just an easy five. Over and above your constant activism for the causes that you believe in and your excellent work as a musician, as an educator, a singer, songwriter, and a performer. So I I think that those things, as you say, accumulate. But I think for me, there's got to be more to it than that, because I think anyone who's 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 a little bit talented in, in time and things. But when you look at the common points of all those things you've accumulated, they have something really important at their center. And it seems to me that that is community. 
Yeah, and that's kind of uh, what I talked about the other day when I um, accepted the award. Um, I think very early on, I got, uh, I really started to feel like uh, sort of doing things that help create community and um, and help uh, create spaces and places where people can make music together, um, or whether it's kind of, you know, standing up and saying something about something uh, that I feel passionate about, and, you know, a social issue or something like that, that that's an important thing to do and that I wanted to be doing that, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I just, I think um, that is sort of the through line. If I were to name three things, you know, it would be music, community, social justice, and kind of how those intertwine and, and um, braid together in some way um, in what I'm doing. So it's really evident. And that's, I mean, that is a phenomenal and very powerful braiding. I love that image. What do you think caused you to believe in those things the way that you do? I think um, seeing it in action, participating, you know, being a participant, um, you know, I talked the other day about going to the Woods Music and Dance Camp that um, uh, one I forgot to list, by the way, <laughs> Lainey, Ma La Lainey Malamud, who kind of um, sort of uh, helped found the Wood Mu Woods Music and Dance Camp and really had this vision of like a community music event um and so i had this opportunity at a very young age to be in a community setting with a bunch of other adults you know most of whom were a lot older than me um, making music together in a space where um, everybody's contribution was valued in some way and and everybody was encouraged to do better like no matter. so you know you might uh, be at the very beginning of learning how to play the guitar or whatever it was, but, you know, if you contributed a song to the song circle, people would turn to you and say, really nice song, where'd you learn that song? Or, you know, um, even if it was a little shaky. Mm -hmm. And so being in that kind of environment and seeing how uh, that was transformative for people that, and, and created people gain confidence when they feel they're in a space like that. And they they learn they're able to learn much more quickly and they're able to they blossom people blossom and it, you know it happened for me personally and I saw it happen around me uh, all the time in this ongoing way and so it just became something that I felt really passionate about and um, you know um, we don't have those spaces uh, sort of mainstream we don't learn in mainstream culture you know, in that way, you know, we mostly learn that people who are uh, uber talented and have billions of dollars to fine tune every little bit of their vocal part or whatever, they're the ones who should be able right. to like yeah. create uh, music. Um, so it was very much kind of counter to that idea. And it really, it, it really spoke to me, it touched me you were brought into those kinds of environments i think in part because of your family right do you want to talk about that a bit yeah well um largely my mom who was a lifelong folky and um she grew up um you know singing folk music and being interested in folk music and um and social activism um and uh as a kid she you know she played guitar and she sang so as a kid, she would like sing with us and, um, you know, she dragged me to concerts kind of against my will when I was eight years old or whatever. <laughs> what? And now I'm, I, I'm like, oh my God, thank you for taking me to see that performer. Is there one you can think of that, that meets that definition that you were dragged to? <clears throat> Pardon um, me. I would say the Watersons. I saw the Watersons mm. at a really young age, Gene Ritchie. Uh, no, not Jean Ritchie, Jean Redpath. That's what I was thinking, a Scottish singer. Um, uh, Pete Seeger and Arlo Guthrie. Mm -hmm. um, one concert that I still remember really vividly was Doc Watson. Um, I was about 10, I think. Wow. And um, he played Tennessee Stud. And Tennessee Stud has a chord progression that's really unusual. Mm. It has a very unusual little chord change in it. And I remember just being completely captivated by that like what is that 
I love that. And, yeah. uh, you know, leaving after the concert and still having that song in my head and wondering, you know, about it and being fascinated by it. So, yeah. So, and, and all kinds of, you know, performances at our local folk music store when we lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, then we moved to Toronto and she's got sort of involved in folk community in Toronto. And um, that's when she, you know, pulled me along into coming to the woods and uh, song circles and things like that. So I'm wondering, you mentioned your, your childhood in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I know you've written about that in your music. It's um, it's been reflected uh, in your service to our community via your presidency of, of the uh, AFM 1000. How has being a cross border kid affected you in, in the music community and particularly in the folk community? Yeah. Um, well, I think my folk music roots definitely go back to like American folk music. And, and um, uh, I sometimes think it's like all this music, this rich cultural diversity and traditions that come from the Southern United States in particular. But um, yeah, I, so I think uh, when I moved to Toronto, I wasn't as familiar with like um, the British roots mm, of North mm -hmm. American music. And that's when I, when we moved to Toronto, I sort of got more exposed to that through, um, you know, uh, the Flying Cloud Folk Club and, and Irish and Scottish and all that kind of stuff. Friends of Fiddler's Green as sort of being exposed to that kind of music. Um, before that, mostly the kinds of music that I had been exposed to was some, um, uh, you know, old time Appalachian music, yeah. Pete Seeger kind of stuff, um, gospel music, black spiritual traditions, union songs, you know, from the States, um, stuff like that. So I feel like, you know, I have this mixture thing going on because of that. You were not immune to pop music, though. I know, oh, no, not at all. I know, you, I know you love the Beatles, and you yeah. and I have talked quite in depth about Paul Simon quite a yeah, lot yeah, and, yeah. And, and others. Yeah. And uh, how how do you think that gets into your work? You know, the, the, oh, I mean, I, I can from the traditions and every one that you've named, and those are the roots, and, and a lot of that stuff is uh, orally transmitted or, or you know, in, is shared in spaces. Yeah. How do you think the stuff that was on the radio and uh, and on TV and stuff got into your Yeah, music? oh, it definitely did. Um, in in our house, um, we had all the Beatles albums. Uh, my my mom was not that into pop music at all, but um, she really liked the Beatles. And it was my brother and sister, I think, who are um, older than me, who mm -hmm. like wanted to get a Beatles album. Probably, be I think this would have been before I was born. Um, you know, when the Beatles were really hip and happening. And, um, and my parents kind of were like, well, okay, we'll get you a Beatles album. And then they loved it. So mm. we consequently, you know, ended up with pretty much all the Beatles albums. And so there was a lot of that. Um, and, you know, as a 10 year old, I had, I bought, you know, uh, Leaf, Leaf Garrett was that, uh, that <laughs> what I'm thinking of? I'd forgotten um, about Leaf. You know, like the boy yeah. band kind of thing Andy of Gibb. this Andy Gibb of the seventies. Like I was into all that stuff. Sean Cap Cassidy. Yes, Captain <laughs> and Neil, all that kind of stuff. And then when I got to high school, kind of more like got into like Motown and the Police and the Clash and stuff like that. So yeah, plenty of um, pop music and rock music um, got in there, and you know, I think it all comes out somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. I you know. Uh, I couldn't really point to anything in particular, but um, yeah. And my sister turned me on to all kinds of singer songwriters, you know, Carly Simon and James Taylor and Carol King and all that kind of stuff. And Bonnie Raitt. Bonnie mm -hmm. Raitt was a huge influence on me. Um, yeah. So, and my brother was really into Bruce Springsteen and Bob Seeger and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think it all, in my, I feel like what, all of that just kind of like filters in somehow. Yeah. and uh comes out eventually you know it's interesting because i think of you uh, uh, probably as the as the person in, in my cohort the kind of gen xers in our community <laughs> who is the most mm, dyed in the wool folky in a way but you're not exclusive to that you're not a folk snob by any means no i i actually love hearing new kinds of music and stuff i mean 
I don't tend to want, you know, turn on the radio and choose to listen to like heavy metal or acid rock or whatever. But if I hear it, a lot of times I can listen to it and be like, hmm, interesting. I like that. You know, there's, I'll always find something that I like in it. And I think that's about the human expression. Like, you know, it's all just like different ways that people express themselves or respond to their environment or whatever. So it doesn't matter if it's jazz or classical or hard rock or whatever, you know, there's always going to be something interesting in there. And I wonder, you as a 10 year old at the Doc Watson concert, probably as the only 10 year old at the Doc Watson concert, (laughs) who hears a peculiar progression and goes home with that. How do you think that your musical muse has brought you through this journey that also includes the social activism and the and the community thing? How does how does the musical piece thread through it because because you're a terrific musician. Oh, thanks. Thanks for saying that. Um, Well, I feel like I've always been I mean, I started playing pretty young because my mom, you know, uh, my brother got a guitar at a certain age. And then a couple of years later, I got a guitar and then I took guitar lessons. And, you know, so there's always like music around the house. And um, uh, I think I came and went from it. I don't think I'm a musician who like just realized, Mm. you know, at the age of 12 or whatever, I'm going to be a musician. It was like something that I did a little bit and I played violin in school as well um, for three or four years. Um, And then I would have long periods of time where I didn't play music at all. Mm. And I think it was, uh, you know, going to the woods, you know, in my late teens and starting to attend song circles and stuff like that, that kind of brought me back to wanting to play, you know, pick up the guitar again. And, and, uh, you know, I took some lessons here and there and people showed me stuff, you know, I can't, I can't, um, count the times when, you know, one of my musical mentor type people would just say, Hey, have you ever tried this? Or, you know, let me show you one little thing. And, and, um, and it all kind of, gets in there somehow. Mm. So, so I feel like music as a, you know, as a performer or songwriter, um, as a player, I've come and gone from it. uh, At different times, it sort of ebbs and flows. I'm not an incredibly disciplined musician. And um, uh, I'm sure I could be much like more technically proficient in a lot of ways if I did that. But um, I'm also I feel like um, in terms of instrumental, I'm more interested in accompanying a song or supporting a Mm -hmm. song has different implications for what you play and what you need to play, you know, what what you have to do in order to do that. And I tend to be a pretty like elemental, I think really elemental and, you know, I tend to not want to do too much to get in the way of the song, you know, so. Well, uh, elemental is, an, is a nice word. I think of you as a really economical player and singer and writer, uh, but you focus on the fundamentals, maybe naturally, maybe after a ton of work, maybe both. <laughs> you always have perfect groove and perfect pitch and you're, you're playing, your guitar playing is so precise and you don't waste very much Mm. up there. Um, Mm. And I, and I wonder, you say that's about service to the song, but I also wonder if that has to do with a value around being present. Um, I guess so. I mean, for me, what's, you know, the reason I would play a song is because I want to express something. I want to say something, it's a communication. So, um, yeah, for me, it's sort of like, uh, not, you know, wanting to put the song across in, in a way that's kind of what I think about rather than kind of like, I can do these fancy things on my guitar or I can make my voice do this. Like I just, I tend not to think that way at mm-hmm. all. So, mm-hmm. um, and I'm sure most musicians don't, but um, <laughs> some have more chops under their belt so they can sure. just do those yeah. things. Yeah. Um, so I kind of learned early on because I don't have so much of that. I mean, I, I think I have, like I'm a really good rhythm player and I have techniques that I can use to accompany a song and I'm really happy with the kinds of things I can do, but I'm not, I don't play tons of fancy sort of stuff. So I think I knew that and I just, 
was like, well, I'm gonna, this is, these are the tools I have. I'm not gonna tr reach for something that I don't have, you know, um, just put the song across like in a really solid way. And I think that's served me well. Well, it has served you well. I mean, you've, you <laughs> not only have your, your albums been acclaimed, but your music has found its way into some sort of really vaunted spaces. I mean, <laughs> watermelon sorbet was uh, was the sort of theme for Richardson Richardson's Roundup. I can't uh, hear that tune without thinking one eight hundred sad goat. <laughs> and uh, but it's just an absolutely lovely uh, piece of guitar picking. And um, if I'm not mistaken, some of your work has wound up in Sing Out and and places like that. Here and there, yeah. And you know, those are that's really high praise and. It's funny because you seem quite grounded within all of that. And I wonder if it has something to do with, you know, when I think of you and your work, these, the, this braid that you talk about, activism, um, community, or social justice community, and music, I think of all of that being an integrated picture. And the word that keeps coming to my mind when I think about you as an artist and as all those things is is a practitioner hmm. you're someone who does this work serious in an integrated fashion as i said and as a practice it's like a life practice hmm. yeah i mean i i have never really thought about that before but i like the word practitioner it's a nice nice word um and yeah i sort of feel like um it's yeah you know whatever i've done mostly it's about getting that thing done it's mm. like putting that thing mm. at the center of of uh of what i'm doing um and trying as much as i can which is not always i mean we're all human and we have our frailties and our egos but as much as i can trying not to make it be about me mm. but about the thing that i'm trying to communicate or the thing i'm trying to do so um so me as a as a you know i i kind of try to be behind that thing mm. instead of in front of it if that makes sense whether it's the song or trying to get something uh done for the union or whatever it's you know um and some of that is sometimes that's to my detriment you know i think uh sort of there's a certain amount of um in terms of the music business getting ahead uh, it helps if you if you uh, have a bit more sort of like me uh, right attitude about it it, 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 so. it looks like that although it's very hard <laughs> to tell because we also see people take precipitous falls from those heights that they've scaled on the basis of their of their ego or their boldness yeah, sure or what someone thought was mark marketable and uh, I, I wouldn't envy anyone those those yeah. falls yeah yeah but it, it, it that's interesting though and I, I wonder, that humility, which is what I think you're expressing, how useful is that in the education part of what you do? Because, you know, you're, you're bringing along groups of ukulele players, you're, you're helping uh, non-professional uh, choir singers bring themselves together and find, find their best voice. You're educating innumerable students and doing workshops and all of these things. Um, do you, uh, obviously, humility is going to help you in, in that. <laughs> but um, but I, I wonder if there's also some degree of mm, a sense of transmission. Uh, yeah, I think so. I guess I think I feel like part of what I grew up with uh, was these wonderful, wonderful musicians, people I met through the folk scene who um, always like shared freely what they knew and always were encouraging um, and uh, went out of their way to help me out in different ways over the years. And so I think I just kind of absorbed, that's what you do, you, mm -hmm. you, and that's what this community is about that, um, that we do share and transmit and it's not keeping stuff to yourself or whatever. So um, yeah. And um, in, like I have, been teaching now for quite a long time. And um, I guess I think about that uh, sense of community that I picked up at the woods and sort of uh, song circles and things like that. And I try to 
create that in my classes, you know, that sense of um, nobody's going to, uh, you're not going to be tested. Nobody's going to slap your wrists if you do the wrong thing. Maybe we can learn something from our mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's more about uh, the joy of making music and when we can, uh, the joy of making music together. So, and, and that that can really be um, fun, but also powerful. You know, it can also really do something for people. So, um, and do something for us as a group. So, yeah, indeed. And, and, you know, that word transmission comes to me because I feel you are the inheritor and the carrier forward of, of, of those notions that you've expressed. And, uh, it occurs to me that the way you might have once looked up at a Ken Whiteley or whomever, you know, picking up one of these, (laughs) um, that somewhere out there, there are younger practitioners who are now looking at Eve Goldberg (laughs) in that fashion and (laughs) mentorship being what it is, eldership being what it is, and our community being respectful of those things. uh, What does that give you pause to ponder? Uh, I'm getting old. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I guess, you know, I really hadn't don't, I haven't been really thinking about that a lot consciously um but um yeah i'm like um if there's i i do want to be help pass things on and and um be helpful to other people so um if i can if i can do that i'm happy to do that whoever kind of comes my way um and uh mostly in my teaching the interesting thing is i mostly teach older adults so usually Mm -hmm. my my Mm -hmm. students at this point are usually older than me but um but um but there are a lot of young folks in our community though. sure yeah and i every once in a while someone will ask me about like um things related to music business or whatever and i like i'm happy to just share what i know and help people along in some way you know it, i think it's part of our responsibility and I mean, it feels a little funny. I don't feel like my life is over. You know, I feel like I still have a lot more to do, but I'm happy to share. Yeah. Yeah, it's a peculiar point on the journey, isn't it? Because you've come along far enough for people to notice and acknowledge and for you to recognize yourself, at least once it's pointed out to you, <laughs> that, hey, you've got a lengthy list of bullet points of, of what we might fairly call achievements, and yet you're a mid-career artist, you know, uh, there's a lot of road ahead. Do you have ambitions for what you hope to do with your gifts in in in, in this ongoing journey? Uh, Maybe ones we haven't heard about yeah. before. <laughs> well, mostly I fall in, what I do mostly is fall into things that I'm interested in. Um, uh, I'm uh, my main performing thing these days is gathering sparks with my bandmate Jane Lewis and um, that has been just a really great musical partnership we love singing together we love making music together we're we're sort of on hold right now because of the pandemic of like like most people are um, but I'm looking forward to we have you know a few gigs here and there but we're kind of waiting until things seem a bit more certain to do more but I'm looking forward to for that. Um, I'm involved, in, I'm not uh, on the board of my union anymore, but I'm involved with the diversity, equity, and inclusion working group of the union and um, interested in working towards making our local a more anti-racist local. And um, I'm, that's one of the things I'm interested in in the folk community mm-hmm. is kind of like um, working on uh, sort of, uh, I think I said yesterday, pushing, pushing or Saturday, pushing the boundaries and kind of uh, thinking about whose voices aren't here that should be here and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, I'm wondering about that. Thank you. It, it's a really, really important aspect of what is going on in our community, in this organization, that being FMO, but also in our folk music community more broadly, and indeed in in the world at large, diversity, equity, inclusion, many of us are sitting with a degree of privilege that we're only becoming aware of obvious as it should have been 
um, their issues crying out to be addressed as a as a lifelong social activist and someone who seeks social justice. What do you think is most vital that we within this community work hardest on? Well, the danger that I see, we have a very, I feel like a very supportive and, and, um, and friendly community. And uh, I think there is a history there of folk music being associated with, with, um, you know, movements for social change. And, um, you know, there's definitely sort of like a stream of musicians through time who have been like great uh, activists and um, uh, and I think sometimes we lean on that. We, mm, we sort of, mm-hmm. we're the good guys and we're the ones who sing the songs about social justice and uh, equality. And um, so I feel like that's um, sometimes be a, a barrier mm-hmm. to actually really in self-inspection and kind of self-reflection and acknowledging where there's needs to be change and so on. Um, so I, it's kind of like the difference between who we think we are and what we're actually doing. And uh, I really would like to see us uh, be doing more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I wonder, <clears throat> pardon me. I wonder sometimes if folk as a genre, having wandered in the woods for some decades, or at least having seen itself that way, led to a sense of like, well, we're the marginalized ones, we, you know, we're the ones who are trying to uplift voices. And so we're a we're a weak party here versus society at large. And that led to a failure to recognize privilege and the extent to which many of us within this community, if, if not most, are actually empowered in many, many important ways. Yeah, sure. And kind of, I think, um, you know, if you look at the history, at least, especially in the United States, I think there's definitely sort of like, we're the ones who, who, um, you know, sing the union songs and and sing songs about working people and, and um, the songs of the civil rights movement and um, that kind of stuff that, you know, I grew up with and know and love. And, um, and I love that part of the folk music history. It's something that I'm pretty, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time um, like immersed in that part of the folk music uh, history or whatever. Um, but I also think it doesn't mean we don't have work to do now, right. you know, and we yeah. should just do it, you know. It's, it's difficult to create increased diversity in community, isn't it? Because one of the things that community naturally forms around is similarity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, I guess I think about like, my sense is like, if we really do this work and really um, push ourselves and, and, and um, uh, do some honest inspection and kind of really try to change certain things about the way things are organized or the way we do things, it's going to change the community, you know, it's going to change who we how we see ourselves and who we are and um that might be uncomfortable and that's mm-hmm. okay you know and maybe it's a good thing actually so um yeah uh but i you know of course i haven't grown up in the community and feeling like it's my home at the same time i have this feeling of like oh i want to protect it and keep it i don't want it to change but i also so you know both things at the same time right well, embracing paradoxes seems to be a really important uh, talent, especially as you as you get get on a little bit down the trail and figure out that all these forces are contending against one another, sort of at the same time. You never strike as someone who is cynical, let alone <laughs> despairing. <laughs> now, you, Maybe behind the scenes, um, maybe your partner Ellen could tell a different story. I'm sure she could. Um, but but you do seem to have really good tools for if you're look if you're a social justice advocate. There's so many signs every day that will convince you 
to be sad. Yeah. And to be hurt and yeah. to and, and, and to be and to weakened. Give up. Yeah. 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 Demoralized. And I definitely feel that on it. And I should say I don't really feel like I'm on the you know, any kind of front line of social justice activism. Um, you know, I uh, I'm a good communicator. I like spreading information. I like, um, you know, I do write my share of letters and things like that. And, um, and I encourage other people to do that kind of thing. I don't feel like I'm on, you know, front lines of every demonstration or anything like that. And I, I really have a lot of admiration and respect for the people who are doing that grassroots organizing work. Um, but I do often feel really overwhelmed and, and uh, sad and demoralized. Uh, but I guess, I feel like, you know, you can have that feeling and still, um, you know, do one little thing or, you know, so I, I feel like I don't try to change the big thing like tomorrow. I try to like I see something that I think, oh, well, that should be different or I don't like that. And I'll I feel like I'll try to do a little bit. To, right. And if we all yeah. did that, you know, it, it makes a difference. It's the drops in the bucket, you know, so I waver between the, yeah, despair and, and, uh, okay, let's get going. Let's do this. Was there ever a point where a light went on for you and you got that that's what you've got to do or did you kind of grow up knowing that or was uh, well, I think I was you know when I was younger like in university high school I was much more out there at demonstrations and kind of uh, um and maybe it's just kind of getting older and and settling down a little bit I just became less uh out there on the front lines but also I realized I'm that's not my strength you know mm -hmm. that that's mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not someone who gains strength from being in that kind of position all the time. So I'm, I think I'm better at the sort of spreading information around and encouraging people to do the facilitating ways for people to get involved who might not be involved now. And so that's kind of where I tend to put my energy, um, in general. So we live in a polarizing moment. Uh, not indeed, kidding. A, a polarized moment, I guess. And uh, I personally, like many others, am struggling right now um, to see eye to eye with many people. Yeah. Um, and we reflect in our community and in, in the songs we love and in the circles we share, we, we reflect on how everyone has a place and we try to manifest that. And yet we're confronted with the fact that some people don't seem to want a place next to us and we don't feel necessarily safe next to them. And we know that is the case even more so for so many people in, in marginalized communities. Do you have any tips? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the short answer is no. Uh, I think this is, I think we're going to have to figure this out. And uh, I don't think my gut feeling is I, even though our, it's very challenging, I don't think kind of cutting everybody off who, who doesn't agree with us, I, I just in my gut feel like that is not the answer, but I'm not really sure. I feel like we are particularly challenged right now by the kind of misinformation and um, yeah, and the kind of um, uh, rabid sort of, uh, energy that's out there around some of these issues and and the inability to listen mm -hmm. uh to each other and um so i don't know what the answer is but i can't you know i i i really try to resist the you know kind of cut all those people off or cut them all out of my life kind of model um but it's challenging yeah it is it is. Well, I think if we all knew the answers, we would implement them <laughs> exactly, right away. Exactly. <laughs> but I, I think there's something to be said for example. And I know you have led your life according to examples that were set by others, whether intentionally or, or just instinctively. 
And I like the example you set, Eve. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you. uh, you're a, a fine, fine artist, an even finer human being. And you do so much for so many in our community, in those little incremental ways that you talk about that are natural to your gifts. And it's appreciated. And uh, we're you. grateful. Thank you very much. I, I'm very grateful to be here and to have this acknowledgement. And uh, yeah, I, I'm still kind of absorbing it. And, uh, and but I just really appreciate the recognition and, and everybody who had anything to do with this award. So, well, I think there's a community out there. Hello, our Hi. community. <laughs> who are just waiting to flood you with interesting questions and um i'm going to encourage them to do that this is how i was keeping <laughs> track and i may reflect on those as they come along and we go a little deeper if necessary and sure. but i turn it over to the audience eve goldberg ladies and gentlemen you, i'm clapping over here my friends Fantastic. <laughs> uh, i'm sure others are clapping at home as well friends please do toss any questions or comments you might have into the chat we've got one here from ann lederman friends um noting about diversity in the folk community. Yes, the folk music community has always been overwhelmingly white and middle class, and David was great to point out that community gathers around similarity. I believe that the word folk itself is a bit of a uh, barrier to diversity because of its mm -hmm. long association with the white middle class. Many people of other ethnicities are put into the, quote, world music box, yep. also a bit of a misnomer and a trap. Hopefully musicians from diverse communities will help guide how this process of opening up and becoming more inclusive can work. I believe our primary job right now is to listen to those who have always felt outside. Thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, uh, 100%. And hi, Anne, thank you for being here. Um, I totally agree with that. And I think um, it's about uh, making space. I think making space is one of the most important things we could do. Uh, and in there's the inviting people into the space but there's also going out into other people's spaces and just listening and trying to understand what's going on in different communities and um and how the the we have our own uh sort of ways that we do things or or ways that we think you know the community should function and that's not necessarily going to be comfortable or mm -hmm. or the way that other communities um function and so i think uh we do have a responsibility to kind of um uh listen and go out into those communities and just listen and and um and hear what's happening and see how can we be building bridges or helping each other out or whatever whatever how are that so thanks Anne, for that indeed comment. and if i can just follow up you know i need to take it upon myself i said ladies and gentlemen which i'm really trying not to do and it's a it's a it's a habit as a host because it's been yeah said a million times and one gets into the habit of saying and i really attempted to become more inclusive in my own language and thinking to say folks or people or friends and uh I'm sorry I said it the other way. And <laughs> these are the little ways, right? That we yeah. can we can begin at least to help those whom we might not have thought of naturally being in our community or historically being in our community. We can at least open the doors. Yeah, be inclusive in your language if you can, you know, sure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks guys. A thought here from Chris White. Uh, who says, hi, yes. Eve. Please, hi, Chris. Please say a bit more about the influence your mom, Sue Goldberg, had on you. Oh, yeah. Well, um, my mom, uh, thanks for asking about that. My mom was um, loved traditional music and folk songs, and she was a great, um, you know, she loved to learn songs from all over and kind of spread them around. She was really the center of the Toronto song and um, kind of without she she had a kind of um, style of leading and and um, and uh, that just she didn't kind of uh, I don't know how to put it it was a quiet sort of leadership mm -hmm. that I think and people really recognized and um, you know she bought me my first guitar uh, we would sing together a lot and um she brought a lot of music into our family life 
Um, she also was always active in peace movement, um, different political kind of stuff, and uh, definitely, uh, you know, absorbed that from her. Um, but I also want to say about my dad, because I haven't talked about my dad, and my dad was um, a wonderful, wonderful human being who had a great passion for life, and he was a historian of science. And when I was younger, I wanted to be a scientist. I mm. wanted to be an astronomer. And um, I, there's still time. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, I still love astronomy and cosmology and stuff like that. But um, he really was very, um, he was an excellent teacher. And I think that in my, I've been thinking about it the last few days, I think a lot of um, the way that I teach and my uh, curiosity about students and what students are interested in and my way of communicating concepts and stuff. I think a lot of that comes from my dad because he was always a great teacher and he was a great music lover too. He mm. was into opera and classical music and um, big fan of the Steve Miller band um, and uh, and always a big fan. He always would get into whatever music we were into. So uh, my sister got really into bluegrass and he got into bluegrass and you know that kind of stuff. So yeah. Do you do yeah. any Steve Miller songs? I don't, but um, that's a good idea. I would like to request <laughs> "Keep on Rocking Me, Baby" at the next Eve Goldberg show. Yeah, that's Maybe really Gathering good Sparks idea. Could do it. There's stuff and yeah, good yeah, yeah. And oh, yeah. yeah. That's, I'm gonna have to go. And think Jane, about if you're that. watching, you can start learning the parts. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to throw my hat in for Fly Like an Eagle instead. Fly oh, Like yeah. an Eagle, yeah, yeah. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, friends, there is more time to ask Eve anything you'd like. Um, and while you're doing so, I will remind you once again, like a brokered record, to sign up for our industry lightning talks on Thursday. There are only two speakers with spots left. So if you want to get in on that, and I know you do, uh, get in while the getting's good. <laughs> um, I guess a question from me, Eve, um, yeah. could you show off your statue a bit? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that. I brought my statue with me to Coburg and uh, to David's studio. So here, I don't know how well you can see it there, but here is my Estelle Klein Award. It's a beautiful uh, wood statuette made by Glenn Reed, which mm. is uh, wonderful, beautiful. So thank you to Folk Music Ontario for that. Uh, was that good enough, Joe? It was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> I was hoping for the SCTV 3D effect when she would walk it into the camera. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I feel like uh, this award is really, I, I'm just really grateful to receive it. And I'm looking forward to um, uh, just absorbing it over mm. the next while and kind of uh i don't know if you know david but i um estelle klein was the first recipient of she the sure award. was and um when she received the award she didn't want to make a speech she said you know i don't i don't do speeches i want to be interviewed and um she selected myself and david bernard i don't know if david is here but um, hey, David, if you are, yeah, <laughs> but she asked the two of us to interview her on stage. So I was in your position for the Indeed. very first yeah. Estelle Klein Award interview. And that created the whole uh, her desire to like not speech but be interviewed, set the the, um, you know, example of like doing this every year. And it's always been my favorite part of the conference. So uh, except this year when it's a bit more of a, <laughs> well, maybe if you had a different interviewer you'd feel better <laughs> no 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 but you know it's different when you're this subject but i have always loved uh watching the estelle klein interview i think it's a really great tradition and i can only speculate that i am less intimidated interviewing <laughs> you than you might have been uh, interviewing estelle well she was some um, pretty definitely had ideas about what she wanted to say and what um you know so we actually i think we had several pre-interview interviews where we did. went through the yeah. questions and and so on but um yeah it was a great uh, wonderful thing to um get to know estelle for a few years um before she passed away and uh kind of an interesting full circle moment i guess here indeed yeah well and she was a remarkable figure and to have lent her name to what has become, as you say, it's more than a, it's more than an award. It, it it's it's a tradition, 
and it's a moment of education, I think, and inclusion really of, of our community. Uh, virtually everyone I've ever heard interviewed has been brimming with recognition of those who helped mm. to put them there. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of people. And um, when I made my speech the other day, I did mention a bunch of people by name um, that I feel like were really influential. And I don't have that list in front of me, so I can't remember them all. But um, all of you, you know, who yeah. you are. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, people who taught me music or showed me, you know, helped me out with career advice and, um, you know, starting from when I was 14 and uh, had just moved to Toronto and Ken Whiteley came to my high school. I went to an alternative high school in Toronto and Ken Whiteley came and taught a music class, mm. an artist in the school's wow. class in my high school. And um, that was in, within a couple of weeks of me moving to Toronto. And I nope. uh, feel very lucky that I met Ken at that time. And um, certainly he's someone who's influenced me a lot and um, has become a great friend over the years. Yeah. And and uh, someone I really appreciate as a person. You know, I'm wondering, uh, in terms of these connections and a lot of the things you've, you've mentioned, they, they have been um, edifying, but not unexpected. Now, what is something that we don't know about Eve Goldberg? What is something that you don't know? Um, I once won second prize at a country karaoke contest in Connecticut. <laughs> Set. I don't know. Well, said. I didn't know that, but I can't. I can't say it totally surprises me. The question is, who came in first? Well, like okay. Alan so Jackson I was with my my friend Chris, my one of my best friends from mm -hmm. high school, who I'm still good friends mm -hmm. with, and we were on we were on a camping trip through New England, and um, we stopped. Uh, we were looking for a place to camp. It was getting late, and we were hungry, and and we passed this sign on the road that says "Country Karaoke Tonight," and Chris says. We have to go, and I'm kind of, <laughs> do. I, and I'm feeling kind of um, uh, you know irritated and and crabby, and I'm like, we got to find a place to stay. And so so he says, well, if we find a place within the next five minutes, let's let's go. And we go around the corner, and there's a camping wow. place. So we went to the country karaoke, and it was uh, you know a weekly thing with local people every week. So, I mean, I, we walked in and um, we were like the strangers from out of town. And yeah. um, so I don't think it would have been good politics for me to win. And there were some great singers. So, you know, uh, but I think it was sort of like I won a five dollar coupon for a drink at the bar. Hey, that's pretty so. good. And what do you remember what song you did? I think I say it was a Patsy Cline. I song. knew it was going to be Patsy. I should have said, do you remember what Patsy Cline song I think it was you did? She's got you. Oh, Maybe. nice one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which I love. I'm I'm a big Patsy Klein fan. So. How could you not be? Yeah. 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 The Eve Goldberg <laughs> you didn't know. <laughs> uh, uh, Eve, after you won that, did you go walking after midnight? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, about I'm sorry about that. Uh, we do have a question that here. That was from... a crazy question. <laughs> we do have a question from Arthur McGregor here. How does your songwriting happen? Do you write with a plan or subject or a melody tune in mind? Hi, Arthur. Thanks for being here. Um, well, my experience has been, I don't feel like I'm the most experienced at kind of dispensing songwriting advice in a way, but my experience has been, um, sometimes I just get a melody or a little, um, I, I would call it a snatch, like a little bit of, sometimes it's melody and words together, and that mean nothing. And then I have to spend some time sort of figuring out what it means. So sometimes they're together. Um, sometimes I set out to write one thing and, uh, somewhere in the middle of the process, like a big left turn happens and mm. the song ends up being about something else. And then the job is to like, get rid of all that stuff you thought it was about and, uh, go yeah. with that other things. So, um, yeah, sometimes it's just sitting down and working with words for a long time and then trying to figure out what, what kind of melody would go with that. So for me, there's all different. Sometimes it's the guitar, like a little lick on the guitar that I find that I'm like, oh, that would be cool. And what could I do with that? You know, so I don't know if that's um, helpful because it's not <laughs> I don't feel like I have a, an actual uh, set method. It just There's no Eve Goldberg School of Songwriting. Oh, no, yet. no, not at all. 
<laughs> and you know, this pandemic, I thought maybe I would like write lots of songs, but really what happened was I ended up being very busy with teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, unlike some people who have put out entire albums or several albums yeah. over the yeah. last, you know, I have, I've been very, haven't written any uh, finished songs at all during the pandemic. So everyone responds to it differently. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but thanks for asking, Arthur. Uh, here's a note from Graham Lindsay, who I'm Hi, sure you, you, you saw very recently. Yeah. <laughs> All star questions. Thank you, All thank star. you to Graham for that wonderful video. I'm just, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Oh, before before I ask Graham's question, remember, friends, uh, the uh, Estelle Klein Award tribute video that Graham filmed is up on YouTube. I provided a link this morning, and I'm sure Graham will put it in the chat as well for people to check out. Awesome. But Graham asks, what great ways? aside from this conference, of course, have you found using technology is bringing musicians together? It is always about community after all. Um, yeah, well, I would say for me, the really cool thing has been, um, an unexpected thing has been that, um, you know, when the pandemic happened, I was in the middle of teaching classes. And so I very quickly sort of figured out how do I do this online? Um, and I was really lucky in some ways because I'd actually been doing some teaching online for about 10 years. So I would say um, uh, what happened for me when I did that, when I moved everything online, is all of a sudden my class available to people anywhere, mm -hmm. which hadn't been true before. And um, so I have students all over the place now. I have. Um, students in Washington State, Delaware, Alabama, um, New York State, uh, Maryland, um, who are taking my classes. It's kind of an amazing thing. And so um, to answer Graham's question, I think the technology kind of opens up this possibility of, of um, uh, getting to know each other and collaborating across great distance. I think people have gotten much, much, much more comfortable with um, sort of uh, long distance, um, working together long distance. And, um, I think there's been some really great, um, collective online concert kind of things yeah. where people have made some great connections. And so, you know, that I, I hope the good parts of that are not going to go away. You know, that even when we get back to being in person that we will, um, we will, be able to continue those connections and um graham i was just listening to your cd in the car and thinking so about it. amazing graham recorded a whole album uh remotely with all these people all yeah. over canada so there's a fantastic example of building community right there graham Lindsay. well and it's interesting too because <laughs> this community although we are sort of reputed or self-reputed to be sort of organic and you know earthy and birkenstocks and blundstones <laughs> in fact the folk music community has always been facilitated by technology. All of the festivals have been organized by long distance. People have been brought together from far, far away yeah. places, have maintained these uh, social ties despite not living in an actual community. Yeah. And let unless me you're in Guelph. And uh, <laughs> But let me say something about that because from a very early age, um, I was the I was I benefited from that by going to these events yes. where musicians were coming from all over North America and sometimes the UK to, to teach at the Woods Dance Camp and um, so really right away and and I recognized that they all were connected to each other and that's one of the things about this folk community that's kind of amazing is how connected we are to each other yes. uh, across great distances and there are people who. I hardly ever see in person, hardly ever. But I feel like they're part of my folk music family. And when I do see them, boom, you just pick up right where, you know, you, you're at yeah. a festival together or you run into them at a conference or something. And it's just like you're, there's, it's no lost time or anything. It's just, and I think that's one of the beautiful and, and um, strong things about this community is that we have these connections with each other around this shared love for the roots of the music you know mm -hmm. um and and all the different ways that that people um manifest that you know the pandemic though has also forced us to do a little bit more work because you and i have spoken on about this on a number of occasions 
things. We're good friends with each other for decades now, but we're used to seeing one another backstage at festivals or at conferences or events, yeah. or whatever. And that is the case for so many of us. We yeah. all have these friendships that, that we cherish, but that we haven't had to do intentionally necessarily yeah. because our work in the world has taken care of that for us. And yeah. the pandemic, I think, has, has caused us to reflect on that and uh, reminded us it doesn't just happen. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like I've um, become painfully aware of like how little I'm sort of actively in touch with mm -hmm. people that are important to me and how um, I sort of, you know, before the pandemic just depended on running into people. And um, so I'm trying to um, I'm trying to uh, get better at just, you know, emailing people or picking up the phone yeah. or texting, whatever, and say, how you doing? Or, you know, if I think of them. So um, so apologies to all my friends who I haven't talked to in ages. Well, everyone <laughs> who has spoken to me, we really hug you. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think there's plenty of digital hugs happening right now for you. Yeah. <laughs> close, David. Uh, we've actually come. There are more questions, but we have come to the end of the session. I think that people could talk and listen all day about you, Eve. Oh, well, thanks for saying that. It's uh, that one hour is enough, I think, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Special thanks to you, Eve, our 2021 Estelle Klein Thank Award you. winner. And thanks to you, David, for doing a Thank fantastic you, interview Thank you. job. Francis, I was honored.